Deep Oaken's world has been around for a long time, but I'm sure you don't know everything its history has to offer. The game we all know and love has been around for centuries and has faced several events that have shaped the Etrian Luminant into its fragile existence. I'm Punchy, and today I'll be guiding you through Deep Oaken's expansive timeline, which has been compiled by the Deep Oaken lore hunters, myself, and the Deep Oaken community. Most of this information can be found in game, and anything else can be inferred from public developer statements. If you want to give your own take on anything in this video, feel free to share it down below in the comments. And without further ado, join me on this dive into Deep Oaken's rich history up until now. Our first stop precedes Deep Oaken Year Zero. I'll be calling this time period the Old World, and it's the first of the three main segments of Deep Oaken's history, as the Tides and the New World subsequently follow. So, I'll be taking a look at the first segment today. The Old World takes place way before the release of Deep Oaken, and even happened before its testing. So let's remember, this is way before Year Zero. The events that take place ultimately shape the environment we play in much later. Mankind starts off with a discovery. Before years were established in Deep Oaken's timeline, humanity discovered the song. From what we know about the song in Deep Oaken's current age, it's that it's present in all beings, attunements, and bells. It's kind of like the force from Star Wars because everybody experiences the song differently. Archmage, the dev that does all the lore, explains that mankind eventually refined the application of the song into a vague but powerful tool. It's safe to say that culture and techniques based around the song had not been taught during the years that precede an event called the Canticlism. All that's known is that the song was discovered by mankind. Following the song's discovery, nothing is really talked about except for its peak, which is known as the Canticlism. The word Canticlism literally means the arrival of the song, and that's what it was. At some point, something brought upon a golden age or renaissance of the song. It was described as a supposedly peaceful and fragile time of innovation. As confirmed by Archmage, the Canticlism was chill and epic, but honestly, it kind of seems scary to me. Being surrounded by instruments and tools of the song, a little mistake could cause ruin. After observing what a single bell can do, just imagine the capability of the song during its peak. I would really love to see that. Anyway, big developments were made throughout the Canticlism, such as the introduction of our attunements and technology we experience today in game. Some evidence for this in game is the tooltip descriptions. The legendary Crypt Blade description reads, a blade said to have been forged during the remains of the last dead. The last fortunate souls at the end of the Canticlism to be spared the drowning. Also, really cool, Crypt Blade is made out of souls. Another elemental weapon, the Curved Blade of Winds, reads a prize blade supposedly forged during the Canticlism by the first Gale Breathers. So not only were attunements developed in this time period, but legendary weapons, basically a flex, were created to represent them. The Canticlism was all about harnessing the song's power into technology and obviously combat. Certain attunements were better suited for warfare, while others had industrial uses. One example that's relevant today is Iron Sing. The current pluripotent alloy provides us with some insight about Iron Sing, a concept developed during the Canticlism. And as we know, the alloy is used to buff up weapons and strengthen them, which, you know, is not really combat. Anyway, during this time, the song was refined, some attunements and their legendary weapons were developed, and much of the world advanced during the Canticlism. It was truly a golden age. After this time period, we learn in game through Hive's telescope that alien-like beings called Celestials landed into Deep Oaken's world and influenced it greatly. In game, the telescope informs us that Celestials were drawn from the heavens to the song, and that's why they showed up. Many believe the Celestials evacuated their homeland and landed up in the Luminant Below. This idea is reinforced because of the telescope's grim description of the city left in ruins. Some known Celestials and confirmed Celestials that impacted the world are Neve, who guide the children of Neve, and the twins Nilsa and Alsen, which Pathfinders worship. The supposed twin Celestial of Alsen is Nilsa, which was Raguzer's character that even Archmage isn't certain about. Here's a photo of Nilsa, but I don't know if it's even real. Archmage says he isn't even sure if Nilsa is canon anymore, so we'll leave it at that. On the other hand, Alsen is very much real. If we talk to Polis and other Pathfinders in game, we get a name drop for Alsen, but that's about it. We can infer that Alsen is a Celestial because many of them say Alsen above or stars above, which is in reference to the Celestials. Neve, on the other hand, is not confirmed in game to be a Celestial. Archmage and other developers have confirmed that she is a Celestial, but no NPCs really give us lore about her. Regardless, her descent into the Luminant inspired a religion called the Children of Neve, who are peaceful in nature. Whoever or whatever Neve was, she was certainly powerful. The Nomads wear clothing blessed by Neve that gives them defense against darkness and the cold. Every single Grimoire starts off with a built-in compass called Neve's Guidance, so she's definitely powerful. The Celestials are the strongest known entities of Deep Oaken's overworld and are not drowned gods. People say stars above are all sin above, which directly contrasts NPCs that say gods below, so that's why we know they're different. The song was interesting enough for Celestial beings to check it out, and at this point, mankind was growing careless. Remember that thing I talked about called the Canticlism? Well, the song was basically being spammed. Finally, humans had harnessed this power, this magic that helped them innovate, make weapons, and even win wars, but they did not understand the repercussions. And just for that, they paid the price.
In true Deep Ocean fashion, nothing comes without a cost. Playing around with the song is not gonna end well. Our focus shifts from the old world and its canticles into the tides, which symbolize a turning point in Deep Oaken history. Just to be clear, the tides still take place before year zero and represent the old world transitioning into the new world. As a fitting punishment for the overuse of song, humanity had stirred something nasty. The drowned gods had not awoken, but this annoying music and mistreat of the song caused a great change. This eventually led to an event by the name of the tides. In real life, tides are an actual thing, and I'm pretty sure Deep Oaken has these sea tides, but the tides to the time period describe an era where the world began to drown. As an attempt to explain this vague drowning, let's take a look in game. In Deep Oaken, each character has several life states, and your initial life status is healthy, depicted by a full orange bar. Everybody starts off like this. If at some point you end up dying in game, you'll respond with a spotted light bar. This will occur when you die in game, but in the lore, you aren't actually dead. Instead of losing your life, you're just being injured. Now, if you die a second time while being in this injured state, you'll fall into the depths or drown. Your soul pops out and sinks underneath, and this this is considered an actual death in lore. But during the old world, dying was far less complicated. Usually when somebody died, we assumed that they were buried, but it was unclear about their fate after life. Was there a heaven or a hell? It wasn't certain. After the old world's canticalism, this brought upon the tides and the drownings. Drownings symbolize the phenomenon of souls sinking into the depths. When you die in game, your soul is swallowed by the depths and that's defined as a drowning. You can view this at a campfire as it documents how many times your character has drowned. Now great drownings are the same thing at a larger scale. For example, Seltor falling into the depths is considered a great drowning where a large amount of souls fall into the depths. I fully believe that drownings are targeted and happen for a reason. When drowning first began, people all over the world began to drown and sink underneath. But I think this was a vague punishment for overusing the song and it was not targeted. On the other hand, Seltor's great drowning was way more specific and targeted only them. Their greed and corruption caused them to fall entirely while others remained safe. And you might be asking, is drowning really bad? I mean, you can still do stuff in the depths. That is true your life still continues, but many normal people do not escape and live terrible lives. Just remember, everyday people do not one-shot enforcers like the player. Anyway, insanity, boredom, various monsters, and the isolation slowly eat away at your mind. People grow old and lose themselves and their family in Scaphosia, which is honestly worse than a normal death. These drownings and the tide affected the overworld as well. The tides brought culture to the Etrian Luminant and the people that lived there. Even the Adret race made its way to the Etrian Luminant and showed up during the tides. To reinforce this idea, an Etrian down in Summer Isle claims the Adrit came with the waves, which makes a lot of sense. Despite popular belief, Adrit have no relation to water or the waves, but the shifting of continents and sinking islands provided travel from their mountainous civilization. So although the tides kinda sucked for everybody, it did open up travel routes. If we're talking about different groups, the hive might have been affected as well. It's speculated that primal Vesperian tribes were so troubled, many of them split up into different groups in the depths and became Ganymede. I'm not certain about this theory, but visually Ganymede are Vesperian without the mask, and maybe they evolved differently. Instead, maybe the Ganymede shed their resistant mask in order to accept the secrets of the deep. I'm not sure if this is true, but I see a connection. A depth connection. The tides were a large turning point for the Etrian Luminant and separated the Old World from the New World. Everything that happened before the drownings are considered the Golden Age or the Old World, and a lot of studious NPCs bring up the existence of the Old Worlds and Old Heads reminisce about its glory. That being said, if everything before the tides was the Old World, everything during the tides is considered the New World. The tides are both an event that ended the Old World and a time period containing the New World. Anytime there's drowning, that's a part of the tides. At some point, this fact was accepted and it became a normal part of the New World lifestyle. Despite these otherworldly punishment, the human spirit would not give up. If you can't fight the sea, you must learn to swim. Everything started with the old world. This time of discovery and wonder ended up being a grave mistake. Despite humanity's attempt at harnessing the song, the world paid dearly for its overuse and mistreatment of this unknown power. As a result, people and their nations began to drown in a cataclysmic event known as the Tides. These drownings mark a separation in Deep Oaken history where the old world ended and the new world subsequently began. 
As the player, we partake in the era of the New World. When people reference this New World, it's one that is both physically changed by the warfare and unnatural disasters that popped up during the tides. But what really sets it apart from the Old World are its ideas and the factions which now surround the song. If we take a look in the game, we can observe the Etrian Luminance modern use of the song. Players and NPCs actively use the song for combat with a large arsenal of mantras, bells, reinforced armor, and elemental weapons available to choose from. Right now at least, the song is not being overused or even spammed. Back in the Old World's Canticlism, the song was used for practically everything and resulted in the punishment from the Drowned Gods. I could be totally wrong about this, but nobody in the game currently talks about the harm of overusing the song. And with that being said, what do we know about the New World? Ironically, the information in-game about early New World lore is very unclear. When Deep Woken dropped, the in-game date was around 1270, and anything before that is a bit blurry. The earliest accomplishment from in-game lore is told through a weapon description. The Pale Morning's tooltip claims it's a replica of a famous Kanor warlord who was known in the first century of the New World. Likely, this warlord was associated with the Central Authority. Many Kanors are a part of this group, and it would make sense for the Authority to be making some commotion. The Central Authority is a massive military force stemming from the Central Illuminant. They can be found all over Deep Woken's world, and it's believed that their expansion relates to their mission of peacekeeping. Not much information is given on this, but their peacekeeping techniques are anything but moral. Their tendencies to torture and stop resistance is shown in game with the Authority interrogator skill tree. The Authority's presence is a consistent threat in the Etrian Luminant. Their connections to Starswept Valley and the Summer Company are highlighted with their Hive base, Fort Merritt, and the soldiers that stand guard with stolen Summer technology. What's What's interesting about the Authority is their information about Etria and its elusive Lord Regent. Currently in Deep Oaken, the Kingdom of Etria is in a flimsy position. Their collapse seems apparent, but we're just not there yet. Right now, the King of Etria has disappeared and the mysterious Lord Regent has taken his place. Kenneth, an Etrian guard, questions how Lord Regent obtained his position and is silenced. It's ironic how the Central Authority and Etrian Kingdom fight against each other because both of them use violence to stop protest. The Lord Regent is not a good person. In fact, his intentions are certainly evil. He's a contractor, somebody hiding within the Ministry, a cult that worships the Depths. One Authority official, Warden Jericho, recounts in his journal that he fears for the Etrians led by Lord Regent. That thing they call a Lord. A non-human contractor is what he knows Lord Regent is. It's also implied through the Blind Seer text that Seltor is repeating itself through Etris with a seemingly benevolent or good king who helps out the nation. And we all know what happened to Seltor. Lord Regent is not who he seems. Another goal of this lord is obtaining the Forge of Sin from the grasp of Duke Aresia. Well, what is the Forge of Sin? Apparently, it's an artifact from down below and a remnant of the past. Whatever it is, it's definitely not safe. To prove this, Duke Aresia used to be a peaceful and generally sane protector of Aresia, the floating island. His original intentions were positive and his creations protected those on Aresia. He's a powerful scientist that brought life to the stone golems using his bell, but something changed him. After getting his hands on the Forge of Sin, which Lord Regent is not happy about, he went insane. Very similar to Warden Jericho, Duke Arise wants to prevent another drowning, but his way of doing this is transforming innocent villagers into something of use. It's a morally gray situation, yet his terrible actions work toward a time of peace. A deeper look into the island of Aresia grants us some information about Lightkeepers. Travel between Luminance seems to be an effect of light or light magic, which only Lightkeepers can use. In the Hidden Village, Nimia states her talented friend was taken from her in order to provide for the world. It's a very sad existence where people are used for their materials, but it gives us a bit more insight about the necessary evil Deep Oaken focuses on. I think these Lightkeepers are very, very important because without them we could not travel between the Luminants, and right now they're running out of time. Another large group that truly shapes the outcome of the Etrian Luminant is the Hive. At first glance, they're very primitive and non-social creatures, but the more you look, the more they really shine. The entire goal for Hive is growing a tree large enough to rise above the tides and save its people. At the cost of draining life, the Hive can create life. That's why I think most of the Aratel Islands are deserts. If I had to guess, many other factions do not like the Hive because of their selfish actions. In the future, they'll end up hurting the entire Luminant as a whole to support their cause. There are so many factions in Deep Oaken history, I cannot focus on all of them right now. The Khan Legion has beef with Authority because they broke their Treaty of Peace. Summer Company provides weapons to the Authority with their fairly advanced depth technology. The Song Seekers praise the song. The Pathfinder and Neve are quite peaceful and follow their celestial religions, which I mentioned in the Old World. The Knives of Elise and Ignition Union are hired by the Authority, but they really deserve their own video. And lastly, the Ministry, which Regent has ties to, is obsessed with the Depths. Since this video is all about the timeline, that's all I gotta say about these factions, but comment down below which group I should fully cover next time. But now, it's time to talk about the Depths.
A lot about the depths has been discovered and said during the tides, but in the new world, many people have circulated throughout its layers. One of the larger groups currently investigating the depths are the divers. These divers can range from harmless researchers to professors of the deep to experienced fighters called black divers, which rarely return to the surface. There are many branches within the divers, but their main goal is to research and fight the creatures of the depths. Based off some interactions with aspiring divers and NPCs in the depths, it's a pretty common profession for those that want to explore. All we know is that the depths goes infinitely deeper and in the new world, many factions want to harness its strange powers and phenomena. Two in-game Deep Oaken events have occurred as a result of the depths. The first being the Sharko rumbling which popped up in 1291. The year of winter 1291 marks that fateful night where the rumbling of a million megalodons thundered in our ears. They laid waste to our homes and what little land we had left to squabble over. Basically, the addition of Sharko bait traps caused insane amounts of megalodons to spawn, destroying everybody in sight. And yes, this is real lore. Following this, in 1320, the Hellbell became available, allowing divers and fighters alike to summon extremely strong monsters of the deep for a chance of enhanced loot and gems. I'm not sure if this is real lore, but it has a special place in my heart. So far, Deep Oaken's world has been shaped by corruption, suffering, and the hope of discovering something new. Our greed punished us initially, but the surviving humans adapted. The dynamic nature of Deep Oaken provides us an enthralling story for us to unravel and experience. I'm sure I missed a few things here and there, and I kept out some details to keep it brief, but that's how I interpreted Deep Oaken's timeline up until now. With Layer 2 around the corner, lore will be expanded and even changed, but remember, I'm the real punchy, and I'll always be willing to talk about lore, so let me know. If you want to comment down below your favorite faction or event in Deep Vulcan lore for me to focus on next, it would be appreciated. Anyway, hopefully this simplifies a bit of the lore and allows for more discussion, but please, please, please look into the lore because it's way too deep. And that's all for now, so like and subscribe. Have a good one.